the other day we talked about the uh, Israeli intelligence operation out east in regards to monitoring the Hamburg cell led by Mohammed Atta, Mohan al Shehi, and Ziad Jara. And now we'll talk about the Saudi intelligence ring that was monitoring Khalid al Midar and Nawaf al Hazmi out west. Uh, interestingly enough, regarding Khalid al Midar and Nawaf al Hazmi, is that there seems to be a slight discrepancy into the uh, time frame in which they uh, was gotten into the country. Um, according to the 9-11 Commission report, uh, they actually entered the United States on January 15th of 2000 after their uh, meeting in Malaysia, the high-level summit Al-Qaeda meeting, in which they stopped over in Dubai and then first in Thailand, then uh, the United States. Um, however, there is a competing uh, argument regarding uh, what day they may have come in. And it's a report made by uh, Jeff Hill of Pump It Out Radio, who um, a couple of years ago uh, produced a video, uh, Who is Khalid Benamarine? Uh, which is an interesting uh, bit of information that isn't uh, really talked about by most seasoned uh, 9-11 investigators. Um, and I'll just bring it up a little bit. Uh, according to uh, FBI uh, reports and interviews with Kweli Benamarine, Kweli Benamarine, who's a Tunisian taxi driver, uh, was tasked by Fahad al-Fumeri, who's a imam, uh, of a of King Fahd Mosque in Culver City, Los Angeles. Uh, and he was told to go pick up two Saudis. He didn't tell them their names or anything like that, in which he did. Uh, according to Roger Day, uh, a 9-11 commission staffer, uh, he makes this quote uh, in a 9-11 commission staff statement before the 9-11 commission. Quote, Nawaf al-Hazmi and Khalid al-Midar were already living inside the United States, having arrived in Los Angeles on January 15, 2000. It has not yet been established where they stayed in the first two weeks after their arrival. Um, their claim is that they have no idea what the records are. However, when the FBI, after the 9-11 attacks, of course, uh, the FBI visited Kweli Benamarine, and they gave him 19 pictures of the hijackers. And he was told which two Saudis were picked up, and he pointed out Khalid al-Midar and Nawaf al pictures, but then he thought about it again, and he threw them back in a pile and didn't talk about it anymore. Now, the King Fahd Mosque was already under uh, suspicion and it was uh, the Los Angeles Police Department that was opening a surveillance uh, monitoring operation on the mosque. Um, the, the problem here is, is that if they arrived from uh, Thailand to uh, LAX on January 15th, the FBI would know about it. However, uh, there were supposedly... Uh, according to the 9-11 Commission, of course, they are not sure of this uh, of this uh, momentary lapse of reason or uh, or uh, puzzling confusion regarding that they could be wrong about where they stood. Um, according to Ben Marine, um, he picked them up and they barely spoke, but uh, they didn't speak any English. Uh, ben Marine uh, spoke a little bit Arabic, and he drove them to the, the King Fab Mosque, where uh, both men would meet with King uh, with um, Fahad Al Thumeri. Uh, however, there is reports that where they stood um, was at the uh, the LAX Hilton Hotel. Um, 
Benamarine states in later reports that al Midar and al-Hazmi, um, after he picked them up at the airport, he dropped them off at the hotel. This is according, this is according to Benamarine's statement. No one else makes a statement besides Benamarine. So we have to be careful about whether this is legitimate information or he's giving them um, a dead end. But there is some smoke to this fire. Um, he claims that he dropped them off at the, at the Hilton when they arrived inside the United States on January 15th. However, this is where the, the uh, mystery begins. They were met at the airport by a member of the South of a, uh, by a member of the Saudi consulate. That's according to Ben Marine's statements. Um, the official himself did not go into the hotel room. Um, and according to Los Angeles police detective Vicky Gizzi, um, and I'll spell a name for if you want to look her up, V I C K I um, G I Z Z I, Vicky Gizzi, um, in which after the 9 11 attacks were happening, the FBI began their reports as well as the LAPD regarding uh, Khalid Al Midar and Wafa Azmi, Gizzi ran leads at the LAX hit. Hilton and found that both room may have been rented days ahead before Al Hazmi and Al Midar arrived inside the United States. Um, Commissioner Stafford Roger Day uh, subpoenaed the records for the hotel. Now that you can look it up on Scribd, S C R I B D dot com. Um, or Google LAX Hilton 9-11, uh, and you'll see these records. But the names of the rooms that they were rented by from this credit card that was used, the name of the name of the person is redacted. However, the rooms were rented on January 15th, and they were used, the two names that were used by these two individuals were Saeed Abdullah and Saeed Abdullah. Slightly different version, uh, slightly larger last name. The room was held on January 13th. So in other words, whoever, whoever rented this room uh, rented it out from January 13th to January 15th. That's two days before they were to arrive inside the United States. Now, whether we could say that Khalid Amidar and Al-Hazmi both used the aliases of Saeed Abdullah and Saeed Abdullah, and they arrived inside the United States two days prior, that would contradict what the 9-11 Commission report states because they state that they definitively know they landed inside the United States on January 15th. Or we could say that al Hazmi and Al-Midar um, did land inside the United States on January 15th and that the, two, and that the man who rented these rooms uh, rented these rooms to other Saudi delegates uh, who were financing uh, the room to these two men, and they stood in the room from January 13th to January 15th. At least it's either one of those options, actually. So Robert Mueller, who is now the FBI director, suspended the investigation into Benamarine, and he was deported back to Tunisia. Quite uh, a surprising end to a very uh, enlightening investigation because here's a man who wasn't prompted to pick out those two photographs of Khalid al and Al-Azmi and did it on his own in front of two FBI agents and the LAPD. And why this investigation came to a very abrupt end, uh, we, we won't know why. Uh, but it seems that when it comes to the FBI, um, they certainly were trying to, at least the ground level agents were trying to warn their superiors before uh, what was what was transpiring inside the United States. But certainly the higher ups uh, regarding Mueller, at least, and some superiors in Minneapolis and Arizona, and maybe even in New York, 
uh, we're definitely constructing a narrative here because there are certain anomalies, and I named a couple, you know, the past couple of days, uh, including one yesterday with United Flight 23, which the FBI never investigated afterwards. Well, here we go. Now, here's another anomaly that people really don't talk about, and the FBI quickly dismissing uh, the uh, the investigation uh, right off the bat. Um, and so let's go a little bit further with Al-Hazmi and him and Al-Midar inside the United States. So Al-Hazmi and Al-Midar are now inside the United States. And then for some odd reason, they go into a restaurant in Los Angeles. And while they're in this restaurant, a man who is sitting at a table drops his newspaper in which Al Midar picks it up and gives it to the man. And the man notices that uh, these two men are speaking Arabic and this man happens to speak Arabic and he introduces himself as Omar al Bayoumi. And if you've heard of that name, Omar al Bayoumi is indeed a Saudi uh, consulate uh, and a member, a prominent member of a mosque in uh, Los Angeles as well. He's also known to people uh, that were in the Islamic Center in San Diego as, as well, Lemon Grove, and we'll get into that in a bit. So Al Bayoumi uh, speaks with Al Hazmi and Al Midar, and he, he asks them why they're inside the United States. And they say that they're uh, here for flight training, um, but they never tell them about the operation, of course. But Al Bayoumi, uh, goes a little bit out of his way and actually rents an apartment for them. First two months, uh, he rents a car for them under his name. Uh, he gets them set up with his own cell phone. He act, they actually use his cell phone for the first couple of, uh, I believe it's three months. So Al Bayomi, who was later interviewed by the 9-11 Commission in, in Saudi Arabia in 2004, he actually states to them, that I've always helped uh, young Arabs who come into the United States. Um, well, I would say this is pretty genuine and pretty suspicious if you ask me, but we'll have to leave it right there. Um, and so Al Midor and Al Hazmi meet with Fahad Al Thumeri at the King Fahd Mosque, and he sets him up with another imam in San Diego, in which Al Hazmi and Al Midar are trying to look for room and board because they leave the premises in Los Angeles after a couple of months. Um, they consider Al Bayoumi to be too nosy. Al Bayoumi actually would walk around with a video camera and he would video camera everything, uh, almost like a, a videographer, a daily videographer. Um, so, incidentally enough, um, it was Al Hazmi, Nawaf Al Hazmi, who, who thought that Omar Al Bayoumi and uh, was he a Saudi spy? Um, let me, before they go into San Diego, let me re re uh, relate some information to you regarding their stay in Los Angeles. Um, Al Bayoumi now and his uh, confidant, Osama Basnan, um, were both later to be found uh, Saudi GID spies, general intelligence directorate operatives um, later on, much later after 9-11 attacks happened. Um, it is stated that Omar al Bayoumi worked for uh, Dawa International, but he never did. He was actually a ghost employee where he would get a paycheck from the Saudi government for being an employee that never worked at a company before. Um, al Bayoumi uh, would rent uh, an apartment for al Hazmi and al Midar in Parkwood Apartments. And their apartment was number 150, actually. Um, when they use a cell phone, um, they also help. Uh, when they used uh, Bayoumi's cell phone, he would call long distances, and which Al Bayoumi didn't care um, because he would pick up the bill anyway. Um, And Al Hazmi and Al Midar would go to the nearby mosque, and it was in Cal Culver City, and that's the King Fahd Mosque. 
um, in which they would meet one Modar Abdallah, who would act as a translator for them to get their driver's licenses, uh, their social security cards, uh, their applications for flight schools. Now, this is important because al and al-Hazmi were tasked to be pilots. This would lead to me that these were the hijackers of Flight 77. It is suspected. This would make sense because Hani Hanjur is the alleged pilot of Flight 77, even though I don't believe that. I think there is a sixth hijacker aboard that plane in which fellow investigator, 9-11 investigator, Nelson March did a fantastic uh, documentary called uh, Six on 77. I suggest you, you go view that, in which he hypothesizes that um, there is a sixth hijacker uh, who is actually reported, initially reported to be Zia Jara, but he wasn't. And he was dressed in black and he got on the plane. Um, he got on flight 77. Nobody knows who he is. And so um, there are news reports that came out later about uh, his actual name. I forgot the name that they use, so forgive me there. But um, go check out that documentary. It gets more into detail about that. So Al Hasmi and Al Minar, to get back to them, they were training to be pilots, but because they spoke no English and no English at all, um, they were actually a poor choice uh, to be used inside the United States. But because they were um, seasoned Al-Qaeda operatives, in fact, they were suspected to be involved in the uh, USS coal bombing. They were also suspected to be involved in some way in the 1998 East Africa U.S. Embassy bombings as well. So out of all the hijackers that were involved in the 9-11 operation, Al-Hazmi and Al-Midar were definitely the most seasoned. And they also served in the Balkans, Croatian wars as well with um, Al-Qaeda that were fighting against the uh, nationalist governments there. Um, in regarding to Al-Hazmi and Al-Minar, they stood inside Los Angeles for a while. And then when they, when they moved, they moved to San Diego, um, in which... Al Hadmi and Al Minar would uh, relocate inside Lemon Grove, which is located in near San Diego. Um, the Islamic Center of San Diego uh, was frequented by Al, Al Hasbi and Al Minar, um, and they wanted to rent a room, actually, or rent a studio. And they saw this um, piece of paper that had um, an offer of renting rooms and inside the, the Islamic Center. And so they took the number that was posted to it. And the number that was posted to it went back to um, a man by the name of uh, Abdus Sutter Sheikh. Um, Abdus Sutter Sheikh supposedly was a, uh, an employee at San Diego State University as an English professor. Um, so al Hazmi and Al-Midar meet with Sheikh, and he rents a room to them. He actually meets with them and talks to them and feels comfortable with them. Um, and they tell him the same thing, that they're here to uh, become students inside the United States and learn how to become pilots. Um and this would be a common theme for a lot of Arabs in the Southwest, especially in California, Arizona, and New Mexico, um, even in Oklahoma, um, in which uh, I did an interview with Mitchell Gray, who authored a book called um, I Heard You Were Going on Jihad. Uh, that's on my podcast. I'll link to that below so you can listen to that, in which the FBI months prior to the attack, even a year prior, were warning their superiors about a, a large number of Arabs training to become pilots inside the United States. And there were some informants in some of these groups, and uh, some of these groups were had nefarious agendas. And this is way before 9-11 attacks happened. So al and al-Hadbi stay with uh, Abdus Sada Sheikh, not knowing that Abdus Sada Sheikh is also... An FBI informant. 
Now, he's been an FBI informant for many years, going back 10 years into the late 1980s. In fact, he was recruited by uh, an FBI agent by the name of Stephen Butler, in which um, he was tasked uh, to um, become the eyes and ears inside uh, the Islamic Center inside San Diego. Um and he was given a code name, Stan. And that's what he would be using as his name to Stephen Butler. Um, and so Al Hazmi and Al Midar uh, stay with Abdul Sheikh inside this apartment. And Sheikh actually tells Stephen Butler about two men that are renting his apartment, but he never gives Butler their names. And he says that um, they were mostly secretive and they were always together. They never left. Uh, and they never went around except um, when they went to take uh, English courses in which they failed. And Al Hazmi would be too lazy to go uh, to English courses. Um, he claimed that they were both pious Muslims and that they were modest when watching television. They couldn't watch uh women in bikinis for some reason, uh, as he says that uh, he asked Al Hazmi one day and they were watching um, Baywatch one time, uh, which is a cheesy show about uh, lifeguards. And it starred David Hasselhoff and uh, Pamela Anderson and many others. But um, Al Hazmi couldn't watch it. He went to another room and according to his Islamic beliefs that he couldn't uh, watch TV with um, uh, scantily clad women. But he would, wouldn't would give Butler any type of pertinent information. In fact, there really was none, except that, um, that they would have visitors inside the apartment and that these visitors would come sometimes in uh, very expensive cars, sometimes even limousines at all hours of the night. Um, Al Midar and Al Hazmi, um, it would later come out that the FBI interviewed people even at Parkwood Apartments in Los Angeles uh, that the same thing would happen. Uh, they would be visited by very prominent people. Who these people were, we don't know. Um, but they said that it was becoming an annoyance and that whenever they used the phone, they were loud and that the cell phone Al Hosby and Al Midar were using without with which was Elmar Abayumi's, uh, they thought it was tapped too, um, because they had suspected that Al uh, Albayumi was a Saudi agent. Um, in which they told Abdus Sutter Sheikh their their suspicions about Albayumi. And Abdus Sutter Sheikh didn't know who Albayumi was at this point. There was no link there. Um Meanwhile, Al Hazmi and Al Midar would, um, well, Al Hazmi would start working at the um, the Quick Mart in San Diego. Um, it was a gas station that they got a job in, that he had a job in. Um, days before, or the morning of September 11, 2001, the employees there, uh, according to one uh, interview of one employee, an ex-employee. Um, I'm sorry, it wasn't Quick Mart. It was uh, Star Mart. Um, and Al Hazmi would actually fly to um, to Yemen because his wife was pregnant. Um, Hoda. Uh, Hoda Al Hada, who is the daughter of Ahmed Al Hada. And Ahmed Al Hada is the man who owns the home in Sana Yemen, in which that home uh, is the communications firm Al Qaeda, in which the NSA and CIA had, had long monitored in the mid 1990s. Al Hazmi stood in San Diego. He never leaves, and he gets a job at Star Mart, um, servicing cars, cleaning cars, um, and and whatnot. Um, on the morning of 
9-11, it was reported that the employees of Star Mart um, were excited, overly excited about an operation that was happening. And when the 9-11 attacks were happening, um, they were celebrating um, the attacks. This was uh, actually hardly reported by the media. And I think this should have been investigated quite thoroughly, even though the FBI did in their pent bomb investigation. Um, the owner of the Star Mart, uh, who was a known radical, who espoused daily anti-American imperialist uh, uh, foreign policy, he used to he used to um, lambast uh, United States and Israel, and by the way, Star Mart was actually in um, La Mesa, California. Um, and it was called Stan's Star Mart. So if anybody wants to um, look up uh, this story about Star Mart, uh, look up Stan's Star Mart. Um, and uh, you could do some uh, research there regarding uh, Al Hazmi's um, work. Uh, history there, as well as individuals who may have uh, foreknowledge about the event, because according to one of the employees there, who is whose name is redacted in the FBI report regarding um, uh, the pet bomb investigation, it is stated that Al Hazmi was actually talking to some of the employees there, in which he states that there's going to be a an operation where they would use planes and crash them into um, targets, but he doesn't name which targets that he implies. This would be, if it's true, this would be the first time that we get uh, foreknowledge about an event coming from uh, one of the operatives involved. So, after, after the 9 11 attacks happened, Stephen Butler goes back to Abdus Soda Sheikh and Sheikh says that he has no idea that Al Hazmi and Al Mido were involved. Now, whether they told him about the operation, we can't say because Abdus Soda Sheikh actually doesn't say and he never relates. But there's some mystery behind Abdus Soda Sheikh. When investigators went to San Diego State University, they said that they never heard of any Abdus Soda Sheikh teaching an, econo- uh, an English uh, course there. So he basically lied to the FBI regarding his work history there. Why? I don't know. Regarding Omar Abayoumi and Osama Bastan, who gave funding to Al Hazmi and Al Midar. Well, according to the FBI reports, they found out uh, an interesting link. It seems that through the 14 months or 16 months that these two men were getting payments, it was coming from payments that were made to Noida Dwijak, who is the wife of Osama Basnan. That funding that went to Noida Medijak's bank account came from a bank account owned by Haifa bin Faisal from Riggs Bank. Haifa bin Faisal is the wife of one um, Bandar bin Sultan, nicknamed Bandar Bush, who is the U.S. Saudi ambassador under the Reagan, Carter, both Bush's administrations. He's actually close friends with George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush and has been friends with the Bush family for decades. When they interviewed Omar al in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, 
the 9-11 Commission found his testimony to be suspicious because it is stated that Omar Bayoumi had no idea that the payments were coming from any Haifa bin Faisal. He says that he actually gave money to them because he felt sorry for them and he liked helping Arab people. When they interviewed Osama Basnan, Osama Basnan was later to be found uh, even more gregarious in his testimony, in which he says that, yes, not only is he friends with Khalid al Medard al Hazmi, he actually uh, finds that Osama bin Laden is a hero, and he actually threw a party many years prior for Omar Abdel Rahman, the blind sheikh, the Egyptian radical, the leader of Gamma Islamiyah, and the man who was sentenced to life imprisonment for being involved in the Landmarks plot and for being somewhat involved in the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. When they interviewed Fahad al Fahmeri, Fahad al Fahmeri was a lot more deceptive in which he denied ever knowing any Kuali Benamari. He denied even knowing who Khalid al-Midar on the Wafa Hazmi even was. And when they showed him photographs of Hazmi and al-Midar, um, a Saudi intelligence officer who was with Fahad al Thamari actually whispered into his ear. And this is coming from Roger Day, who's a staffer. And afterwards, he says, I've heard of the name al uh, al-Midar because of the media press by then who were, were naming people involved with the attacks. But that was the end of that. Those testimonies can be seen at Scrib.com. Memorandum for the record. Omar al memorandum for the In fact, you know what? I'll just link them at the, below at the bottom of the video. And so here we have Saudi GID operatives monitoring and funding two al-Qaeda operatives in Khalid al mirar and al-Hazmi even living with an FBI informant in which Stephen Butler uh, threw his hands up in the air regarding Abdus Sada Sheikh, saying that he probably was deceptive with him regarding the two men anyway. It just uh, it really defies belief that we are to believe that these men just came into the country and they weren't monitored right away because they were, much like the Hamburg cell were out east. These men were always being monitored. And that's the whole point of me doing these videos, showing you that the intelligence apparatuses of like the CIA who were monitoring everyone abroad. And while they were inside the United States, you have Israeli and Saudi intelligence monitoring these people as soon as they got off the plane.